Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast, where we celebrate individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the outdoors. Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism is the sponsor of our episode today. Warm temps and fresh seafood make the Alabama Gulf Coast the perfect beach destination for your family vacation, couples getaway, outdoor adventure, meetings, conferences, and conventions. Our guest today is Anthony Richardoni. Anthony is the co-owner of Admiral Shellfish Company based out of Fort Morgan, Alabama. Admiral raises and harvests prime oysters grown in South Alabama. Anthony, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Welcome. Thanks, man. Good afternoon. Appreciate you talking about some delicious Alabama seafood with us. Oh, my God. Let me tell you, when Easton Colvin from Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism said, Howard, I got one lined up for you. How do you feel about oysters? And I'm like, oh, my God, this this man is going to be making my mouth water because I love oysters. They're good friends of the farm. We love having them out. Fantastic. Now, asking for a friend, do you ship oysters throughout the country or you pretty much just stay local? We don't yet. It's part of our long-term, like one of our long-term business model revenue streams we want to add. Right now in Alabama, we have just as strict or stricter health regulations as anybody in the U.S., which is, which probably isn't something most people out of state associate with Alabama, but we are on the cutting edge of like time to chill the oysters, harvest restrictions. Right now, they don't really let farms like me ship direct to consumers, we'd have to set up our own oyster processor and a bunch of other technical things, but uh, not yet, but they are available down in the Southeast locally. And, and we sell from everywhere to Houston, New Orleans, up to Nashville, over to Atlanta, back down to the coast. There's plenty of places to get out of the oysters besides us shipping okay. them to you right now. All right. I, I love that. So uh, Las Vegas is out. I, I get that. <laughs> I, get, I guess this now, means I'm going to have to come down to uh, Gulf Shores and I'm enjoy right some barn. oysters. Do it, brother. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, in, in celebration of the of this project with Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism, what I would love to know first is a little bit more information about you. How did you get into oyster farming? Yeah, it it years ago I started. I live on the bay, about fourteen miles from the, where the oyster farm is today. And Auburn University does a great job of oyster gardening down here in collaboration with NOAA and Sea Grant and a a bunch of extension agents. They they do this everywhere from New York City to Chesapeake Bay, places in Louisiana and Mississippi. But basically, they give homeowners a certain amount of spat baby oysters fixed to a shell, and you grow them up. And between, say, hundreds of hundreds of homeowners, that's enough to replenish a reef kind of year to year. And just getting more interested in that, I just started realizing that there's a lot of new aquaculture technology out there. For the last 15 or 20 years, there's kind of been a renaissance on farmed oysters versus harvesting wild oysters. Just kind of started reading more about it and just fell backwards into it and still kind of keep a day job with some pharmaceuticals, but most of the times at the farm and it, you just kind of fall in love with working on the water and all that kind of stuff eventually. So just one thing led to another. Be careful if you get involved in oyster gardening, it might turn uh, into a farmer. Sometimes I, I do wish I had another career. Well, I love my career as a podcaster and as a coach. Right. The career before that is where I could have used you. It's like, oh, it's your farm. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> you said something just a few minutes ago, and I have to ask the question, Eagle or Roll Tide? Right, War Eagle. <laughs> All right, War Eagle. All right. When I moved to Montgomery, Alabama, so by the way, I do have a little bit of credibility. I lived in Montgomery for a year. <laughs> that counts. Uh, yes. <laughs> When I came into the office the first time, the account manager didn't say, hey, Howard, nice to meet you. She asked me the question, who who, who's your allegiance to? And I said, whoever you want it to be. (laughs) That's that's a convenient way to answer. I mean, obviously, Bama and Saban have been pretty dominant last decade or so, but Auburn's had their wins as well. That's all I'm going to say about that. There you go. There you go. So (laughs) I'm curious, how has Wild Oysters... And I imagine they've been harvested for a long time because once we realize, well, we can eat these mollusks, they're, do I have that name right? You do, mollusks. They're they're bivalves within the mollusk occasion. Okay. When did the commercial view of 
raising oysters? When did that start to kind of take hold? E- even in going back to the first written history around here in millennia before native peoples, people have always been harvesting oysters. And okay. there's some really good books out there, not to shout out anyone at anyone else's expense, but like the big oyster, kind of about the, the New York City and, and the, the Blue Point area harvesting. Over time, obviously, we started depleting the natural reefs. And people realized that to go back and enhance those reefs, kind of the first beginnings of aquaculture, even in colonial, maybe early 19th century, 1800 times, people knew that, hey, we collect spat, like these larvae when oyster breed that get in the water and a little baby oyster will cement onto something and grow into a seed that we call oyster spat. People started really getting behind, let's go to the places where there's lots of these baby oysters and replenish reefs else, elsewhere so we can keep a commercial harvest going on. And whether they knew it or not, that was kind of the beginnings of aquaculture. In the 1900s and certainly the early 2000s, you really, everywhere from Prince Edward Island, Canada, all the way down to where Auburn University, kind of the Dr. Walton and some of his efforts in the early 2000s down here started training, whether it's fishermen or just people on the working waterfront or, or oystermen that, hey, you can commercially buy spat, just use top water floating baskets like we have at our farm, kind of behind me in the video, where we can, instead of relying on what we find in the water, we can plant a certain amount of oysters, use tex- techniques, same way that Wagyu beef uses certain husbandry techniques on, the, on that beef to make a really premium product. Mm-hmm. We can develop our own practices and modify the oyster as opposed to just going out and fishing for it. And that's, that's what we focus on today at Avril Shellfish. Okay. Now... When I was visiting the Admiral Shellfish Company's website, and I did do a little bit of whole work beforehand, you you market yourselves as a premium purveyor of oysters. And yes, sir. So, question, what does a premium oyster look like? Great question. And I've actually got one right here. It's uh, the, the simplest way to explain it. Probably not going to be great on video. The simplest way to explain it is a predictably deep cup and a flat okay. top. Okay. Why is that important? It's easy to shuck and it plates in a really desirable way. The oyster meat itself is floating in what we call the liquor or right. I hate to use juice. It's kind of a nasty term, but like the, the natural liquid that the oyster has. Right. When you plate the oyster, you want to maintain that. There's a lot of really good proteins and salinity and things that affect our, our palate inside of that. So if you have a deep cup, the table presentation is easy. And if you're a chef, if you're spending money at a restaurant and charging a premium price, you don't want six or 10 different size oysters across a dozen. Right. You want the oysters to be shapely and similar across that order. And we, we use about a half a dozen different techniques at the farm to get these deep cups. So it's easy to shuck and it plays really well. That's the main difference between a wild oyster, which is a little less or a lot less predictable on what kind of shape and size you're going to get. Okay. Okay. Now with oyster farming, especially in Southern Alabama, the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. You have a lot of instances where we have done some not so good things to the environment, to the water. Now we have climate change doing its thing. What are some of the obstacles folks like yourself at Admiral Shellfish or some of your competitors, what are you all doing to prevent or minimize the the effects of some of these obstacles that are that are coming your way a great question i'll try not to be too long-winded but i mean if you okay. look back the nature con- cons- conservation the nature conservancy has a really good article out there about how maybe 80 or 90 percent of our natural reefs on the gulf coast and el- elsewhere have been depleted and so the wild harvest has to be managed very carefully now because just the numbers aren't there and there's a lot of reasons for that i mean there, there's been the deep water horizon was, was largely an offshore event. Oysters are grown in the bay and in the estuary. But of course, that wasn't a great time. Damming up rivers, the way erosion and siltation happens in the bays, the, the dying of seagrasses, wave energy from ship traffic, all the way to things you said about climate change. And uh, we're in a pristine area. We don't have any development within dozens of miles of, of us. But if a sewage treatment plant popped up near an oyster farm, which is, is not a problem we have, but that wouldn't be a good thing, obviously. But there's mm-hmm. a lot of towns on the Gulf Coast. So those are kind of the headwinds for the national environment. We get to take a lot of that off the table. We chose the most pristine area left on the Alabama coast. We're right, right down this peninsula called the Fort Morgan Peninsula to the mm-hmm. west. If you're looking at a map to the left of Gulf Shores by about 20 miles. It's very sparsely populated. 
And due to some historical things like the Battle of Mobile Bay and the existence of the Fort Oregon structure itself, the whole area is basically protected and, and we're not near a lot of commercial shipping traffic. So we've got this pristine bay water meeting the Gulf of Mexico a thousand yards next to our farm where we're getting a good, clean tidal flush every day. We've got a nice, shallow, sandy bottom so the water doesn't have a lot of turbidity and sediment in it and things mm -hmm. like that. And beyond that, if you, like the image behind me, we're growing our oysters on the top of the water column. We don't get the predation and the low oxygen that exists if we were growing them in the bottoms of deeper, muddier waters. And further, oysters eat plankton, phytoplankton, which are things that use the sun to grow, and zooplankton, which are very small animals that the oysters filter out and eat. The top of the water column is a great place for our oysters to catch those, those things. So they're real happy because they get to eat. They get a lot of wave energy, which chips them up, causing that deeper cup. Mm -hmm. And every week or two, we're flipping these cages over so the oysters are sitting in the sun. And we're that close to the sunlight on the top. So we can use that to burn off things like algae and barnacles. So that when a chef orders a case of these things, you, of course, they go through a processor, but they get a nice clean shell without fouling and stinky stuff like algae clinging onto the shell. So okay. we kind of took the best things that oysters evolved and what they wanted and just gave them, gave it to them in the most concentrated way using some of these aquaculture technologies that we have available to us today. Okay. You mentioned the word predation, and I'm curious mm -hmm. because I've seen photos, say, in the, the Pacific Northwest, Northeast. Yeah. It's an animal. I want to say it's a beaver. Could be wrong. Knocking sure. two shells otters. together. What's yep. otters? That's it. What are the, who are the predators to the, yep. the oyster? The, we do have otters down here in coast Alabama. They're not okay. very common. They're a little farther up in like the freshwater areas, not so okay. much near us, but we, we did see one actually a few weeks ago, Joe okay. or amazing farm manager actually spotted one, but no big, big picture at the Admiral shellfish farm and speaking for most of the Gulf coast farmers an oyster drill, which is a, it looks like a snail mm -hmm. hermit crabs don't make a shell, right? Hermit crabs are going to go find a snail shell or various other types of shells to use. Oyster drills have a little tool that they stick out called a proboscis where that they can use an acid to melt a hole in the shell, liquefy mm -hmm. the oyster and drink it out. Well, that's no good for us, obviously. Okay. But when the oysters are on top in these cages, knock on wood, they can't really get after them just as easily. Some other really common predators down here, if the oysters are very young and the shells are brittle because they're just younger and not as thick, stone crabs and blue crabs can actually break that shell and consume the oyster. Certain types of drum, like we get some huge redfish down here. I mean, bull reds, black drums, certain types of skates that look like stingrays, basically cow rays. Right. They've got these two bony plates on their mouth. They can come in and crunch up the oysters. And uh, I know that in other, in other areas, other ecosystems, there's types of birds. I don't really think that's an issue down here. I might be wrong about that, but those are kind of predators, various fish, crabs, of course, otters could do it, different skates and rays, things like that. Okay. But uh, when they're in a bag inside of a cage, they don't really have access to our oysters. So we can, right. we can leave them for the real predator, the humans to come eat whenever we want to harvest them. I, I'm so. all for that. I'm all for that. <laughs> but just, just, just want to give credit where credit's due for the, the predators. Cause it's all part of one big exactly. cycle of life. So it, exactly. that's the way things go. I want to go back to the, the, to the sustainability aspect, not so much about, well, I would imagine Organization companies like Admiral Shellfish Company, you are you active in a, like an association or of yeah. other shellfish growers that that advocate for certain things to happen in management and, and sustainability? Big time, man. It's I mean, it's a privilege to be able to use the water. I mean, technically the seabed belongs to the people of the state of Alabama. So we actually have kind of a, a lease from those folks to be able to even use it. So when you put a, when you put an adult oyster in the water, besides sequestering carbon and some other things that, you know, when the oysters filter in the water, they're not consuming everything. They're kind of like us, they'll excrete some waste products. Mm -hmm. So they're filtering about 50 gallons of water a day. So you, you wow. put a million oysters in the water, you start talking 50, 50 million gallons a day and do the math on the rest of the year. We're having a really positive impact on the bay with water quality, controlling wave action, erosion, those sorts of things. But in terms of the groups down here, Oyster South is amazing. They really help just gather all the farmers down here, everything from the East Coast, you know, North Carolina down to Florida, all the way to Texas on the Gulf Coast, gathering us together, having one concerted message around everything from climate change, just to you name it, just 
educating people that, hey, this isn't a bad thing to have in your backyard. It's not, it's not exactly like a fish processing plant. And not that that's a bad thing either necessarily, but it's, it's something that where we almost have no net impact on the environment. We have a negative, like, like extraction impact where we're taking bad stuff out of the environment. Like, we're not going and harvesting oysters from a wild reef and depleting it. We're taking spat from a lab, growing those oysters out and producing an effect on the, on the bay, the estuary that wouldn't have happened without us. And oyster stout is a great resource for that. There's an East Coast Shellfish Growers Association that's actually kind of had started a branch on the Gulf Coast, but it's, it's getting back in gear right now through some efforts of some good folks. It's going to be the Gulf Coast Shellfish Growers. Um, Auburn University Marine Sciences, Sea Grant with NOAA. We, we're actually hosting an Auburn University project on our farms, those pilings that we have out in our site, where they're they're trying to research how to get wild spawns uh, back going, as well as how can we increase densities of oysters in aquaculture to get more of these positive effects we're talking about going. I mean, if we're farming six acres, we can double our density. Talking about those millions of gallons, it can have a big effect scaled across North America. So. We, we, we all, we're, we're up against researchers every week and we like it because, you know, you don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, so to speak. So it's nice having some of these folks out there that can lend us a scientific view on if we're observing something funky going on at the farm. So it kind of works for everybody. Sure. Now, you've got the scientists, you have the, the schools, you have the visitors, uh, which I will, unless something extraordinary happens, I will be <laughs> down there in September. So I will let you know that. Yeah, man. <laughs> what can the public the residents, the people who are living in these communities around you, around the farms, what are some of the things they can do or perhaps what are they doing to help support companies like yours and this commercial oyster farming? Yeah, great question. I mean, buy local seafood. I mean, I don't to get preachy, but we don't need to be sending a truck from Canada down here to buy a dozen oysters. And ask your chefs, ask your oyster bars, where are these things coming from? And hey, there's 20 oyster farms in Alabama. Why don't y'all carry a few of those? We create a lot of jobs down here and have a lot of positive effects on the bay. Take a tour of an oyster farm. If you have access to the waterfront, look into the Auburn University Oyster Gardening Project. Get involved with growing oysters on your own dock, learning about the biology and helping rebuild the reefs. Get out there and work with some of our local charter captains. You'll probably wind up fishing some hard bottom or fishing on some oyster farms. There, there's a number of things you can do, but, you know, everything from just being a consumer and asking for local seafood all the way to getting directly involved with, with helping by being an oyster gardener or just getting out there and fishing our reefs and learning why it is such a big resource. Okay. Sounds like a plan. And then I, I love that there's, what you just shared, there's many avenues for people to get involved local. And, and I do agree. Why should we bring, be bringing something down from? Canada when it can all be harvested right. locally. I, I love that. I am curious, your oysters, how do you prefer to consume these wonderful, I don't know what I, yeah. I was trying to be cute on this question, but <laughs> I, I'm totally flubbing it up, but how do you prefer to eat your oyster? Man, I'm not a purist. Like I know it's kind of like wines. You'll get some people out there say, oh, you can only have it this way. Don't put ice in it. I mean, I love a raw oyster as much as anybody. Mm -hmm. I also love them cooked. I mean, yeah. throwing them on the grill, keeping it simple, just some butter, garlic, some Parmesan. There's a million recipes out there. Like people that a lot of times away from the coast might have a gumbo that might not have any seafood in it. Try yeah. a gumbo with that. There's an oyster stout. The Admiral Shellfish Company collaborated with Big Beach Brewing in Gulf Shores, Alabama. This Friday, February 3rd, okay. we're releasing an oyster stout that we brewed. There, there's a million recipes out there from oyster stuffings and stews, excuse me, all the way to a baking things. That There's a lot of recipes for like oyster breads that go back to colonial times even. So I'm not a purist by any means. Raw oysters are great. Get yourself a nice cold beverage with it, but don't be afraid to just Google some oyster recipes out there. I love it. It's funny. So I live here in Las Vegas. I've been here yeah. going on three years now. And I was kind of joking on Facebook, asking for a friend, looking for a place to live. And Kay, my friend from Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism, chimed in, Howard, I'll check out Mobile. And I'm like, okay. And one of the reasons I would love the area is I'm a foodie I and I love oysters. And awesome. I would love to have them any which way you can provide those. But just the food... That's, that's really na native to the, the South. Right. It's just unbelievable. So uh, speaking of Gulf Shores and Orange Beach tourism, what types of activities do you 
coordinate with them because they're they're trying to attract people like me, the organizations that I am a member of, right. to come down and just experience the best of the Gulf Coast and Gulf Shores. How are you interacting with them to not only promote your work, but also to give folks, the visitors, a taste of what it's like to, to come down and visit? For sure. I mean, we, we love doing tours. We don't really have the staff to do them every day necessarily, but you know, the Outdoor Writers Association and folks like yourselves, if we know you're in town and I really, I can't wait to meet some of you and your colleagues in September in person, but, you know, just doing tours, naming a couple of local restaurants where you can find our product. And just in general, in Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, I'm an avid fisherman, but you don't have to be a, a dedicated recreational fisherman to sign up, to hop on a snapper fishing boat, taking dolphin tours down here. There are so, there's dozens and dozens of miles of hiking trails that the state of Alabama has set up on the beach and some of the kind of inshore coastal environments and things. There's a ton of indoor activities to do here, everything from whatever people like to do, golf simulators, movies, but this is an outdoor paradise down here. Yeah. And you could, you could eat two or three square meals a day and still want to be going back for more. So uh, just a ton to do down here. I love it. And I, I'm actually hoping to get down there for a few more days before the conference and stay after just to take it all in. So I'm definitely yeah. looking forward to it. But you mentioned, uh, you don't, you didn't have the staff to do a lot of the activities. So I, but I am curious about, you're not a one man operation. So tell us a little no. bit more about your staff. Absolutely. So Joe Ingram's our forum manager, wouldn't trade him for the world. He's got really, really deep aquaculture and uh, management and just biology and general experience. Him and I are kind of the, the full-time core. My partner, Chris, is actively involved. We, we have an awesome marketing lady who helps us out. Social media is kind of unavoidable these days to get the right. word out. You can, you can have the best thing in the world, but if nobody hears about it, where those consumers are looking for that, that item, it's just going to be you enjoying it. And we have a great part-time crew that kind of comes in and out, a bunch of folks down here that have all kinds of backgrounds. Some of them work on the water, with the, they have jobs with the state. Some are uh, with local produce farms. Some folks are just kind of here seasonally, but we, a couple of days a week, we'll have the big crew out there. A lot of days, it's just two of us out there and making deliveries and things like that. But we are capable of doing tours. So if someone's in town, they can go to our website, admiralshellfishcompany.com and just kind of send an email like, hey, Thursday, we're around. Can we stop by for an hour at noon? They can download a weaver right there. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of times I'm telling people it's not a good weather day and we're not doing that to avoid anybody, but it's Alabama. Yeah. They say, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes, it'll change. We don't want to bring people out here before we not wins and oh, all yeah. the fun stuff. So, <laughs> so and, I, and I love that. It just, it's amazing that some organizations rely on a, on a much bigger team. You've got people across the entire supply chain of this organization, right. but it sounds like yours is kind of lean and mean. But you it also is. have the the benefits of some of the educational and government organizations who are coming down for the purpose of studying and working to get, gather data for what their research is. So that's exactly, and I guess too, one of the things that occurs to me as the years go by, it's we're literally just the farmer. I mean, we have there's dedicated facilities that grow the seed, and there's dedicated processors and distributors that move the product. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're not capable of doing some of those things as time goes on and we, and we get more and more staff like we're getting, but it's kind of like pick one thing to be great at. I mean, we, we like just focusing on the farming and making the best possible product and letting else somebody be great at, Hey, that last mile trucking or processing the oysters or what have you. So we kind of choose to be just lean and mean farmers all the way. I, I love that. I came to Vegas from Chicago and in both places, there was a mesquite grilled chicken vendor nice. and all they did was chicken and they did it right and i love yeah. that you, you, <laughs> some people try to be something for everybody and there's but there's a lot to be said for focusing on what you do well and do exactly. it well, and do it great i so, just love it i love that now let's talk a little bit about some of the nice places these these wonderful oysters of yours are showing up where where can folks who are coming down to South Alabama, where can they pick up these oysters? Yep. We get a lot of people ask us, can I buy them retail? Can I just take a, a sack home and shuck them? And we'll talk about shucking a little more later, I'm sure. Okay. But 
if they're looking to just buy a, a dozen or a case of a hundred, whatever it is, Ahi Seafood and Fairhope and Bonset Core Fisheries has a, have a seafood market that we work closely with. Okay. But restaurants, I mean, are really what we focus on. It, it drives most of our sales and just the the scale that we're at as a farm. Right. Um, and I hate to forget anybody, but if you're down in the Gulf Shores, Orange Beach area, Voyagers at the Perito Resort, Jesse's, some of the restaurants at the Wharf, which is a great place to go. Even if the weather's bad, there's a lot of indoor activities at the Wharf you can do. Red and White and Mobile. I know I'm forgetting a bunch of places like Pearl and Hope Farm and Fairhope. And then certainly out of state, I mean, and it's funny using processors and distributors, occasionally a chef will order our product and we won't even know it. Like we just met a great crew at La Chat Noir in New Orleans, which is, they just won the fine dining restaurant of the year award down there in their, in their second or third year of operation. And they're new friends of the farm. So we, we get to meet a cool new chef every day, but it's a little harder for us to tell somebody in Houston or maybe Nashville where to go. But certainly down here, those restaurants I mentioned, will be a good place to check for us. I love that. Well, we're going to provide as many of the backlinks to those restaurants and awesome. any of the other links that you have highlighted during this conversation. We'll have those on our show notes. And I'm curious, besides the, the restaurants, besides the, the resorts, and you go to the, 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 the stores, how about the whole festival season? Because yeah, I can does. imagine there's lots of festivals down in, in South Alabama, Gulf Shores, Orange Beach area. Absolutely. COVID definitely threw a wrench in one of the kind of established oyster festivals that had been happening. Murder Point, and we, we, talked, we talked about the word competitor earlier. All, all the farms down here, I, I think about us more as colleagues, and that's not right. just fluff. I mean, th there's enough demand out there where rising tide lifts all boats. So we do collaborate with each other. I love that quote, by the way. That's like one of yeah. my favorite quotes. <laughs> We, I don't wish any ill upon any other oyster farmer. This is hard enough without, without, without us trying to undercut each other. But Lane, there are a lot of at Murder Point had a festival that they did this past fall that was really successful called Experience the Oyster. And I hope they do it again in November of 23. Chuck Wilson, one of the owners at Navy Cove, is doing a festival on February 24th of this year. I guess that's about three weeks from now. It's going to be called the Fort Morgan Oyster Festival. That, that's something to real pine. If people want to get interested in, they can come join. And we're hoping to see a lot more. And like I said, COVID really threw a, threw a wrench in some of that. And there's so much logistics with, with raw seafood compared to just like a, a sausage festival or something, for example, sure. that a few of these things, there's a lot of talk about people wanting to get them started again. But those are the two that I hope to see again this year. The Fort Morgan Oyster Festival on February 24th is definitely a go. People can Google that and get tickets now. And then hopefully the experience, the oyster again, that Murder Point Oyster Farm, they're a big Really, really good farm down here as well. They should be doing that again this fall, hopefully. So. Very good. Well, we're going to, again, we're going to provide as much of the content and our links and our show notes with the links to some of these events. Hopefully we'll get that one up. It's going to be in a couple of weeks that we should be able to, since it's the start of our podcasting season. So I, I'm curious, as you look back on your, Anthony, any surprises, any like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, uh -huh, don't quit your day job. Yeah. <laughs> don't quit your day job right off the bat. I mean, I, I think we've got 20 or 24 legally licensed farms in Alabama. Alabama's got a 55 mile long coastline east to west and a lot of bays, river side of that. But I mean, out of those farms, I'd say maybe 13 or 15 of us uh, sell consistently and at a commercial scale. But it's tough. I mean, it, you're not going to start an oyster farm and be profitable right away. And you can't get into something like this but, but because you love money and, and profits alone. Like you've really got to enjoy working in the water, whether it's sunny or cold or windy or whatever it is. But I, get, I guess I didn't anticipate, I mean, it sounds a little naive, but years ago, we thought we kind of had our, our minds wrapped around everything mother nature could throw at us. The H word, hurricanes, all the way down to kind of floods and stuff. But this past year, unfortunately, in April, Starting around April 7th of 2022, the bay started to get really fresh. And that's not a surprise. I mean, the rivers have been cresting here for thousands of years between March and May. And we know it's coming. But something, something occurred last year where the temperature spiked and the salinity went down. Maybe there was some low oxygen. It's kind of hard to say. There was a bit of a redfish kill some, sometime around then. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to say what was going on in the bay at a large level. But we had a huge die-off. And all of our colleagues at the other farms did, too, outside of a couple really uniquely placed farm. And... We learned an important lesson there because you develop all these relationships with chefs and distributors and it kind of breaks your heart when they're putting in an order and you just say, man, I, I just don't have it. So we kind of had to 
start some of those accounts back from scratch. And that was an important lesson where instead of having a 10 or 20% buffer, maybe shoot for like a 30 or 40% buffer. And if you have more product than you can sell, well, that's, that's not as bad as having the other way, less sure. supply and more demand. So that, that was a tough lesson for me as recently as last year when I started thinking we had a little bit of it figured out, but apparently not. <laughs> so. I'm curious, you, know, you talked about having this buffer. How do you create this buffer? I mean, to ensure that there's still yeah. the, the freshness. For sure. And freshness is a great point. And it's also quality of the oyster. So every week we're drying them out to, to keep the shells clean. We're tumbling through a big trommel, like a big tube to split out the sizes and chip them up. We're shaking the bags. We're thinning the bags to keep them less than 50% so the oysters aren't too crowded. If you have too much of that to do for your staff, obviously you're going to get behind. And you can start see it, seeing it show up where the shape will be less consistent. It'll have less of that desirable cup and everything. So we, we try to plant what we think we can handle physically. But if you take the risk and plant a little bit more in case there's a die off, you can always do some other things with them. We, we, we're still able to sell some oysters to the shunking market, more for like frying and po' boys, sandwiches, stuff like that. So if we start getting behind, we can take some of them and instead of handling them like we normally do, pack them into certain types of equipment where they're just kind of sitting there and still find a market for them. Granted for a lot less of a price, but still be able to get them off the farm as seafood, break it even, maybe profitably. So it's, it's just a balance. And we're learning something new every day. There, there's, there's folks that have been doing this a lot longer than us, even though we are pretty well established and it's nice being able to pick up the phone and be like, Hey man, help me wrap my head around this one. And, or what are y'all okay. seeing at your farm this year? Stuff like that. Okay. You, you also mentioned a little bit ago about shucking the oyster and, and I have been to New Orleans a couple of times. That's like the first place I go to is to get a dozen oysters yeah. and those guys, that's hard work. And so yes. what you wanted to share a little bit about shucking. So. Let's, what's your story? Absolutely. And we just did a great article with Great Days Outdoors, a magazine kind of focused on the outdoors, obviously down here. And it, the article is called How to Shuck Oysters at Home, because believe it or not, even until we started really getting in deep in the festivals and everything, I didn't ever shuck a ton of oysters, even when I was farming. We're not getting high on our own supply, so to speak. We're here <laughs> to sell these things. And yeah, Darn. I'll take a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I'll take some home almost every day just to kind of keep track of what they taste like. And we, we articulate that to the chefs. Hey, it's salty or it's fresh or whatever. Okay. But long story short, you don't need to have, sh have shucked oysters your whole life to figure it out. You, you need to get a, a glove, preferably a chainmail glove, certainly a glove and a rag so you can stay safe and you're not getting cut by the lip. But if you just take your time and realize that you're not trying to break into the oyster, you're trying to get on that hinge and use it like a key to pop open that hinge and then remove the muscles that are holding the oyster in place and give it a flip. You can watch a few YouTube videos, have never shucked oysters before and do a pretty good job at your next house party or reception or whatever it is, just enjoy them on a Sunday, whatever it is. But at a festival, it's a little different. We're doing a, um, an event, like, like I said, the Fort Morgan Oyster Festival, February 24th. It's going to be me and my crew shucking then. And you'll see a bunch of different numbers. A good oyster shucker every hour can shuck a couple hundred, maybe maybe three or 400. And I, I can't do anywhere close to that. But over the course of two or three or four hours, you're going to get worn out. So we can kind of back into, okay, at the last festival, we shucked a thousand oysters with four guys in four hours back into our hourly rate and try to get some more help there just so people aren't going home with carpal tunnel. And what, what you don't want to do is scramble the meat because, you know, the meat, it's got fat protein and glycogen, kind of the same right. thing all animals are made of, right? To an extent, along with water and minerals, what have you. But if you, if you puncture that oyster, not only does it not look visually appealing, it, it'll look pretty nasty if it's all scrambled up, but it can actually affect, affect the flavor and how long it can sit on the ice and things like that. So shucking, besides keeping yourself shape, safe, there's a lot of technique to it where you have to understand the shape of the oyster and how to get the presentation going. But luckily with YouTube and some of the articles, like I mentioned, you can kind of look like a pro after your first couple dozen these days if you just take your time. All I don't right. like people having to be intimidated by because you're right. I remember I, I was actually born in New Orleans, grew up in Slaughter L across the lake. And yeah. you see some of these ladies and guys shucking there, just banging them out, wild oysters. Their arms are bowed up from doing that for years and years. <laughs> and, and that's great. And that, there's a real skill set there. But 
I don't like people getting intimidated by that either. Like you can do it at home and just take your time and, and have fun with it. Though. Sounds good. I do have a, one of a couple requests. First one is if you share the link to that article, we'll put that up on our show notes as well. We also have a link to from the yellow hammer that I found and yeah, we'll have, to have okay. that up. Yeah. And another question is when we come down for the tour at the, at the, the company location, are we going to have a oyster shucking demonstration? Are you going to put us through that? Yeah, you can count on it, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, seriously, we've got, we, we've, we've acquired some shuckers over the year for obvious reasons over the years, just some festivals and just our crew showing people how to do it. So it's something fun to do where we all kind of sit there and do it together, enjoy a beverage and just take our time with it. And, and you can see, I mean, I hate to say how easy it is, but if you just take it slow, and I love wild oysters. I'll never say anything bad about wild oysters, but th they can be unpredictable. If you have a yeah. five inch oyster that the hinge is shaped one way, your, your next oyster is shaped differently, you'll feel like you can't get in a rhythm. Right. Ours have that deep cup and a flat top. And you can kind of figure out that like, whoa, like what I just did, I can actually replicate again for the next oyster and get into a little bit of a rhythm because we're so consistent with our oyster shape. I love that. A couple of conferences ago, and, I, and actually I think we do at every conference, I'm like, I'm not doing this. We have this uh, push-up contest, okay? <laughs> there's a bunch of old guys, and I'm an older guy, and, and there's even the women. And it's actually the, the ex-president of the, of the association has been the winner of the push-up contest, oh, man, which, tells, that's right. which tells you something. But I, I have a feeling we're going to have a shucking contest. So, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do that. Yeah. I love, yeah. So any insight that you would like to leave uh, with our listeners before we head out today? One thing that I, I wish more people knew about is every people are familiar with terroir with wine. You can okay. have two vineyards in old Europe on, on one side of the Rhine River and because of the minerals and, and the rainfall and which side of the hill and which way the sun's facing and all that solar energy, people understand that wines can vary greatly. And oysters are the same way. When you just order a, a dozen oysters and you want to just get some food in your belly and have a beer. Hey, I grew up doing that. There's nothing wrong with that either. But if you have the chance to go to an oyster bar and grab, grab two from some Alabama farms, a, a few of us, grab a couple from the Northeast, grab a couple from Canada. The West coast has incredible products. And just looking at some of the differences, the same thing you can do with craft beer and different cuts of beef and different wines. We have the same different distinct oyster products, a couple miles from each other. It, it, I understand, well, let me try one from Florida, one from Alabama. The way the coastline is shaped and the way the tidal rivers around us affect the salinity and the turbidity of the water. If you, once you can kind of get a taste for the different creamy or sweetness, more vegetal taste, different levels of salt, oysters have just as much variety as any other fine food or beverage product out there. And using that mindset when you're at an oyster bar, kind of spread the love out and Find out what it is you like and go back and grab yourself a dozen or one that maybe you didn't have before. Maybe just kind of hit your palate right. So that's something I enjoy a lot. Very good. I have a feeling that I am never going to look or consume an oyster in the same <laughs> way again. So I want to thank you for that. That is actually a marvelous gift, Anthony. I appreciate it. And by yes, the sir. way, there is well, my last ask for you is you've got this wonderful image of the farm behind you. I'd yeah. love to have a half a dozen or, or close to a dozen photos that we can use in our show notes because that'll got it. also highlight some of the great work that, that you're doing. So appreciate that. Yes, sir. Before we head out, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm not a huge social media person. I know a lot of people that read outdoor magazines might be in the same boat, but it, the, the best way to kind of follow our adventure day to day, whether it's the crazy sea life we're running into or just some of the operations or the, the insane weather stuff that we run into, our Instagram handle is at Admiral Shellfish Co. And every week or a couple of times a week, we'll try to post something just interesting that we see, or maybe a festival we're doing or a new piece of equipment, or Hey, maybe just something we broke that week, <laughs> which happens a good bit too. And besides that, we, we work with great days outdoors and podcasters like yourself. If you just Google Admiral Shellfish, we have half a dozen or a dozen articles on everything from some of our conservation efforts. And we have one coming out now. That's just, what are the health benefits of oysters? What, what is it about an oyster from omega threes to trace elements like selenium that make it a good food product? So just Googling or any of your preferred search engines for Admiral Shellfish and 
to really put yourself visually with us at, at our Instagram account. We, we try to keep people in the loop on there. Fantastic. Well, we are going to provide a backlink to the website, Admiral Shellfish Company.com, as well as to the page Admiral Shellfish Co. And I did start following you today. So I'm looking forward to getting to know more about you prior to my, my trip. And I, I love that. Anthony, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. And so really appreciative of the great folks from Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism to introduce us. And really, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, man. This has been a blast. And if I could talk about oysters all day, just, just give me a shout. So. I love it. I could, I could talk about it and eat food all day. So that's probably <laughs> a good match here and there. Listen, stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Anthony Richardone from Admiral Shellfish Company. What a wonderful conversation. As I was sharing with my roommate, I am about to learn more about shellfish and oysters than ever have in my life. I just cannot wait to get down to the Gulf Shores and really just indulge and learn more about oysters and consume them, whether it's fresh or grilled or baked, however we do it. I'm going to, I'm going to be there. I may even share some pictures on my social sites. We really appreciate Anthony taking time out of his busy day. As he had shared, he's a farmer. This is hard work, but you know, these, these oysters, these farms, they're giving so much back to not only the community, which they serve, but they are also getting back to the environment. I mean, these wonderful valves, they are filtering the bad stuff out of the out of the water and really helping to our enjoyment of, of the outdoors that much better now again go out to anthony's website for admiral uh, shellfish company at admiralshellfishcompany.com or as well as on linkedin admiral shellfish co and you can find us on the outdoor adventure series.com website we are also on facebook and on linkedin outdoor adventure series and you can find us wherever podcast directory you listen to your podcast. Just search for Outdoor Adventure Series and this episode. Thank you again to Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism for sponsoring this episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series and introducing us to Anthony and the Admiral Shellfish Company. To begin planning your beach vacation, getaway, or outing, visit the Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism website at golfshores.com and we're going to provide backlinks to it as well okay folks wherever you are whatever you're doing go out there have a phenomenal day and we will see you on a future episode of the outdoor adventure series podcast take care now